Hi. Are we awake? I have some deals to make with you before we start. This is the State of the Industry Retargeting Report. They're going to hand out copies of this on every table during the break. Also, our Programmatic Mind magazine, which is not fluff and sales material. It actually has some good stuff worth reading in it. If you remember that, and if you promise me that you'll pick up this, then my job's done, and I don't have to show you 43 slides of charts, and we can talk about some stories instead. You know, when you're on an airplane and you sat in the emergency exit, and they say, will you give me a verbal yes that you agree to help us in the case? I'm asking for a verbal yes. Does everybody promise to look at this, and we won't look at 43 slides? Yes. Thank you. OK, that's my job done. All right, I'm actually hoping for a bit of luck with this presentation. My last three <laughs> have not been so lucky. A um, couple of presentations ago in New York, uh, I jet lagged, got up on stage, did my presentation. The conference owners decided to ply me with lots of alcohol, to say thank you afterwards, which I kindly took on. Walked out of the building and got hit by a car on Fifth Avenue. So that one went well. A couple of weeks later, I was giving a presentation in San Francisco, and I used to live in San Francisco, so I was just down the road from it, and I woke up in the morning. Bit of a theme here, but the conference organizers had taken me out the night before, had a little bit of a headache, decided to take some pain medicine before going up on stage. I took an Ambien. <laughs> All the Ambien takers in the room know what happened next. So it's now 8.30 AM. I'm due on stage at 11 o'clock, and I've got Ambien coursing through my veins at an astonishing uh, rate. So I get dressed, take a shower, plow myself with coffee, and I head down to give the presentation. And I'm falling asleep, literally falling asleep at the front of the stage, ready to do my panel. So I said to the organizer, you need to give me two hours. So they push my presentation back to 11. I walk down the street. I go take a quick nap, come back, and do the panel. We get to questions at the end, and a lady puts up her hand and said, uh, you asked the same question at the end of the panel as you did at the beginning of the panel. The effect of Ambien means I had no recollection of the start of the panel in comparison to the end. The third one that went wrong just before coming on stage here, I just got new glasses. And my daughters, uh, my stepdaughter, saw them on a picture last night. And they all sent me messages that I got this morning about 20 minutes ago saying, you look like Harry Potter. So <laughs> nothing like a confidence boost of four little girls all knocking you down saying you look like a fictional character. All right, so this industry is chocked full of bullshit. Chango as a company is kind of a no-nonsense brand. We kind of see it as our job to cut through a lot of this BS, and that's kind of what we're trying to do with this report, and it's kind of what we're trying to do with this um, magazine. I wanted to start by cutting through two particularly important terms that are relevant to this industry and are very important for you to understand the report and the rest of the speakers. Let's kind of take the fluff out of big data and programmatic for a minute. Big data, my god, we're an arrogant industry, aren't we? For us to go walk into big brands like Sears and Walmart and so on and say, hey, as an industry, we just created big data. Really? Because they all had big data long before digital advertising ever existed. So let's be real. When we're talking about big data in digital marketing, we're probably talking about more data than you were using before. right? And the trouble with that big data is that it's scattered around in lots of disparate sources, and it makes it very difficult to use. And so what's programmatic marketing? It's the glue, right? It's the tools, it's the Boolean logic, it's the if this, the in that technology that brings all that data together and actually means you can make some use of it, OK? So what do we do? Well, we use that big data and that programmatic targeting on behalf of our brands, prospecting, branding, retargeting, no real surprise with those. We have two really important differentiators, though, that I do want you to be aware of. The first one is lots and lots and lots of exclusive data. So we're the second largest source of search data in the world. That's really cool for doing intent targeting. And many of our clients and agencies are in the room, so I thank you for that. The second one is really interesting and relates to the question that was received at the end of the last presentation. We, uh, many of you will be using technologies and media companies that say they're real time. And probably many of you are saying to your bosses, hey, we're doing real time marketing. Well, those technologies are really focused on real time media buying. What no one ever really talks about is the fact that that data is very rarely real time data. It's usually pre-crunch segments. So people like Ebo, e Ebo. 
eBay and Lego use Django because uniquely the data is real time as well, and that's a really important differentiator. It means that they're off targeting and retargeting individuals and consumers before their competing brand's technology has even had a chance to compile a segment. So in relation to that question, what percentage of media spend is programmatic? For the previous speaker, it was a bit of an unfair question, I think, because programmatic and real time have become synonymous with each other, and they're not. You can go buy real time all you want, but it doesn't mean to say you're doing anything programmatic. It might not be data enriched, it might not be complex, it might not have that advantage of programmatic. So what percentage is real time? Really crazy high. What percentage is programmatic? About half of that to about three quarters of that. Do you like that scientific set of numbers? I told you I'm not gonna bore you with charts. It's really big and it's half of that. This is my pet hate with retargeting and this survey, survey shows it. Stalking is when two people go for a long romantic walk together and only one of them knows about it. How many of you have been on a retailer's website, you've looked at something, you've probably bought it, or maybe you've decided you don't want to buy it, and three months later you're still showing out, seeing ads from that same site and that product, right? It's unnecessary. Retargeting, even as a company who offers retargeting to brands, I can honestly say it is overhyped and full of fluff. The idea behind retargeting is it's there to fill in the gaps that are broken in the rest of your, re in the rest of your marketing program. Right? If your site worked perfectly, if your brand was the sexiest brand in the world, if you had no competitors, you wouldn't need retargeting. People would come to your site and buy your shit and you'd be happy. Right? Retargeting's there because that's not the way the real world works, and so you want a chance to bring those people back again in order to do it. Stop marketers making it feel like you're stalking me. Show me something of value. There's a story. <laughs> The future Mrs. Dax Hammond is in the room today. I won't embarrass her by pointing her out. Um, retargeting is a really funny example of how an entire proposal got screwed up, though. So we're not engaged yet. She knows the engagement's happening thanks to retargeting. Because <laughs> I went online and was searching for engagement rings. And of course then she decided she needed to use my computer for something. She went online and saw every page she visited was covered in jewelers ads for engagement rings. So surprise over. Um, we actually met at an industry event several years ago and there was a small chance that the proposal was actually gonna happen here, not in here, my God, can you imagine? Um, <laughs> but in New Orleans, I've never been, she's never been, that's a pretty cool place to do it. And then retargeting in a human form screwed me up again yesterday because I was down at reception and there was a small chance the engagement ring from the, wedding, uh, from the jewelry designer was gonna be ready tonight. So she was gonna overnight it to the hotel. So I'm talking to the receptionist about this potentially being signed for securely, put in the safe and so on. And Sarah walks down and he immediately says, oh, and when the jeweler gets in touch with you on Friday with the engagement ring, we'll put it in the safe for you. So retargeting screwed me up twice with that one. All right, because you all made that promise, we're gonna skip out so many of these slides. I'm gonna show you a couple of brief points that when this lands on your desk during the break, you should definitely take a look at. Thanks to Digiday, this has been her most successful report. This is the fourth on the state of the retargeting and targeting industry uh, since Chango created it. And uh, we have had 333 agency executives respond and 117 brand executives. We actually had many companies that were competitors, technology companies, data providers. They didn't answer any questions in the survey once we found out that was their industry. So in theory, all of these responders are on the buy side. In order to understand these results, there's something really critical that you have to understand. Retargeting is probably not what you think it is. Retargeting as a phrase typically people think of as site retargeting. Someone came to your site, they left your site, you're gonna stalk them forever and beyond. Retargeting actually means someone did something and now you're gonna retarget them with an ad. Well, that something that they did doesn't have to be a site visit. That something could be a search on Google. Um, and so that's why you see on here when people are answering what type of retargeting their money is flowing into, you see site retargeting as the most popular, no real surprise, right? And then search retargeting now, since we created it about five years ago, really catching up. Um, but it's important to note what these two are for. Site retargeting, most people in the survey said was about direct revenue, and some were saying brand awareness. The summary here is site retargeting, existing people, bring them back because your stuff's broken, 
right? Search retargeting is all about finding brand new people because you're retargeting a search event, not a site visit. We have a couple of qualitative quotes that uh, Digiday uh, got for us through the surveys as well. So as the, we go through these, I'm gonna leave these up on the screen for you for a moment to read. This one from uh, Eric from Nissan. My favorite digital geeky industry topic is view through attribution. Uh, don't ask me about it over a beer later at cocktails because you won't get away for about three hours. Um, view through the fact that someone saw your advertising and then they did something afterwards but they didn't click on it, right? The click metric is reducing in popularity. And the more and more studies keep coming out saying the click on display is completely an irrelevant metric. It's the poorest, least educated people who click on banners. Many studies have shown that. If you have a high-end brand, those clickers, they're random people. They're not really correlated to the results of your marketing. View through, as long as it's measured correctly, as long as you trust the partners you're working with and as long as you're buying high quality inventory is what it's all about. And you can see here in this study that about a third of brands now, and it was much higher in previous editions, about a third of brands are using click through only and the majority are either using view through alone or click through and view through. We typically advise focus on view through but use clicks for correlation, and if anyone needs advice on that, we can always help you with that. Budgets are on the rise, really, to any of anyone surprised. Throughout the four studies, they're continuing to rise. Um, they come mostly from display, no one's really surprised about that. This is the other little bit that I wanted to pick up on though, that when this report goes on your desk, because you all said yes and you promised me, so I'm gonna be watching, um, is a really interesting thing you should look at. Paid search budgets, uh, sorry, paid social budgets, is something that we asked about for the first time in this study, and it's actually quite interesting. Most marketers are saying that they have a budget for paid social, and it's increasing. Where is that budget going? This is your distribution, majority to Facebook. How high is Twitter? I'm very surprised at this Twitter spend. I wonder if the respondees to the survey genuinely didn't quite understand what type of Twitter marketing we were talking about. So let's be clear about this. There is the Twitter marketing that probably a lot of you have been doing in the past. You log in, you do your targeting, and it's using Twitter's data, right? Twitter tailored audiences is something that they work with people like Chango on to use our data or your first party data, right, to then target them. They're two very different things. One is done real time using someone else's data. One is done with Twitter's data. I don't think the tailored audiences bit that's meant to be going real time using external data is as high as this percentage. So when you look at the numbers, just take that into account because if you ask people, are you doing Twitter targeting, they might be a little bit confused about where it is. I would also add a little bit of shock to the LinkedIn number. I mean, credit to LinkedIn, right? Everyone go buy some LinkedIn shares off this one. Um, a third of all the people on Facebook were buying LinkedIn. I mean, that's astonishing statistic for real-time targeting. Great quote here from uh, Brian, who I believe is in the audience somewhere um, from uh, Mindshare. I'll give you a moment just to read that. Now these paid search, uh, paid social budgets are becoming budget on their own. We know that people are doing the retargeting on Facebook. FBX claim rightfully that most of the spend that they have on FBX on the Facebook exchanges from retargeting. That shouldn't be no surprise to anybody in this room, right? It's the easiest thing to do. You put a pixel on your site, you run some ads on FBX. What is fastest growing with FBX at the moment is conquesting or prospecting, where you can use external search data to target for people who are browsing or are interested in your uh, competitors' brands or products. And interestingly, people wanting to conquest from competitors is something that uh, uh, came up in the data. Can we do a quick survey in here? Put your hands up if, uh, this is on the definition of mobile. I'm gonna ask you three questions. Uh, one question, three answers. First answer, is mobile tablet only? Okay, is mobile smartphone only? Couple of hands. Smartphone and tablet? Interesting. So this is the data that came out in the survey. There were more people on the survey as a percentage than in this room um, said it was smartphone only. Some of the reasons why we think so many marketers indicated that mobile is smartphone only and not tablet as well 
is simply because um, uh, the, uh, the tablet experience is more of a standard browser experience, standard ads, standard content, et cetera, okay? So I have saved you from 20-something other slides, so you can thank me later. Um, do, just to make sure I've done my job, look at the report when it comes around in the break. Uh, I will be around uh, all day if anyone has any questions later. Thank you.